Hello and welcome everybody to Revive Health's Daily Briefing Live for Tuesday, April 7. This is our 30-minute review of the latest, most important news, resources, and advice for health system marketers and communicators who are dealing with the COVID-19 crisis. I'm Chris Bevelo, Health Systems Practice Lead at Revive Health and your host for the show. I'm joined as always by Chase Kleckner, who is Senior Marketing Manager at Revive Health and our show's producer. Hello, Chase. Hi, hey, Chris. Today, we're also joined by David Perry, who I know many of you know. Dave is currently a senior advisor at Stanford Medicine and principal and founder of Perry IQ, a healthcare strategy and marketing consultancy. Prior to that, he was CMO at University of Utah Health, VP of Marketing and Communications at Seattle Children's, and he has served in marketing roles at Microsoft, Quaker Oats, and venture-backed startups. Dave, hello, sir. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. So as with each show, we plan on covering the latest news on COVID-19 and how it relates to marketing communications in our field. We'll highlight a couple of helpful resources and we will share what we're seeing and hearing from Marcom professionals and health systems across the country. We also want this to be interactive forum. So please, if you have any questions for myself or Dave or Chase, uh, put those in the Q&A queue, which is, you can find at the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, you can also use the chat function in Zoom if you want to talk to other attendees. Uh, but if you'd like us to answer a question, make sure it shows up on that Q&A thread. Uh, Chase will also be using the chat function to post links as we refer to them um, throughout the show. So you can access those immediately. Of course, if you want to um, come back or if you're coming in uh, from some other perspective, you can't join us, you can always find a recording of this uh, on our website, thinkrevivehealth.com. We post a recording of each show every afternoon. Uh, the actual link, if you go to our homepage, you'll find a banner at the top, but we do have a communications hub uh, with a lot of content around COVID-19, uh, and that's at thinkrevivehealth.com slash COVID-19. Uh, also know that you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, which we assume uh, is the most convenient way, really hard to, to free yourself up for 30 minutes every day. Um, we want to be consistent and be here for you at the same time every day. So, you know, if you want to, you know where we're at. Uh, but if the podcast is easier, which it is for most folks, then go subscribe on iTunes. A couple of important notes before we get going. We are not experts on COVID-19, so not a place to come for medical or scientific advice. Uh, we do have opinions on how marketers and communicators can uh, deal with the COVID-19 crisis. But of course, everybody's situation is unique. Your organization is different from others. Your communities differ from others in terms of how you're being impacted. So make sure you keep all of that in mind as you apply what we are talking about to your situation. So as we always do, we start with uh, some news items. Uh, first, we always start with account. So we do that just to keep things in perspective at a high level. Uh, we continue to move through this crisis kind of on the upswing. Uh, there has been talks of peak. Obviously, it's different in every community in the country, but uh, there have been some models that showed maybe a peak in mid-April. Uh, hopefully, at some point in this month, we see a peak and we start coming down the other side. But obviously, depending where we're at with this, uh, all the things we're talking about will take on kind of a different color. So we use the Johns Hopkins University tool, which most of you are familiar with. Uh, and right now, as I refresh that, we are looking at globally 1,381,014 cases of COVID-19 and 78,269 deaths. Uh, of course, we know that the United States has become the top site in terms of countries around the world for cases. We have now surpassed, we talked about this yesterday, if you combined the next three behind us, Spain, Italy, and Germany, we actually have more than all three of those combined um, today at 378,289 total cases with 11,830 deaths uh, total. So unfortunately, that chart is still on the upswing. Uh, and as we've heard, this is, this is going to be a tough week. Hopefully, things will start getting better. We're hearing some good news out of New York in terms of maybe they are peaking there. Um, but of course, as we know, New York was out in front of this. Um, and so other places still have a ways to go. Uh, so we'll be watching all of that closely. The other news, um, because you know we're here to talk about COVID-19, 
Uh, a lot of this is tough, tough stuff to cover, uh, as we all know. So we try to find um, some lighter things. And Dave, you you had <laughs> found out that today, April 7th, is both World Health Day and National Beer Day, which exactly. is- Exactly. Something odd. to celebrate. <laughs> it is. <laughs> It's odd that those two dichotomy, right? A dichotomy for sure. (laughs) That those are on the same day, right? Um, I suppose there's probably some health benefits of beer. Not a big beer aficionado. I'm not sure if that's true. Well, I do have another. uh, I just saw something pass across. A World War II veteran in Oregon uh, recovers from COVID and celebrates his 104th birthday. So I had seen that. Yeah, Yeah, somewhere else. That is good. Mm -hmm. That is very good. We do need to find those lights in the darkness um, to help us pull through. So uh, World Health Day obviously goes without saying that I think every day is World Health Day these days. Uh, But yeah, okay. So let's move on to resources. A couple of them we want to hit on. Again, uh, we have an updated consumer survey that we ran. Uh, It's the second version of it. We asked the same questions uh, that we had a few weeks ago just to see what had moved and some newer questions. So you can go to our communications hub again at thinkrevivehealth.com to find a report out on that. I don't want to dive into that because tomorrow, actually, uh, we're going to have a surprise for you. Jeff Spear, who was on the show last week, I think, Chase, is that right, to talk about the survey? Yeah, it was last week. Last week. So he's back and he's actually going to host the show. I have a prior engagement, so I can't come tomorrow, but Jeff will host and he's going to bring in Ben Fuqua uh, from our data analytics department. And they're going to dive deeper into the survey. So mm-hmm. we won't, we won't touch on that now other than to remind you that it's there. Dave, you had, <coughs> excuse me, mentioned uh, a survey that Stanford has done. Why don't you, why don't you tell folks about that? Yes, we have a uh, Dr. Lawrence Rusty Hoffman, who is on the faculty at Stanford medicine and he has developed a, what, he, what we are referring to as a national daily health survey. And simply you go onto the Stanford Medicine site, it's almost chatbot driven. You answer, I think it's about eight, maybe eight to 10 questions, demographics, your current health status, zip code, et cetera. Have you been, do you feel you've been exposed to anyone, et cetera? And then they'll update that. You'll sign up to be part of that survey and it, it's updated on a daily basis and uh, sort of a mapping exercise for us. And it's good that our marketing team there is supporting Dr. Hoffman. This is something we can do virtually remotely that promotes research at Stanford, obviously been a great benefit to um, the general population. That's great. That's great. So there's a link to that. Obviously, uh, Chase is providing that in the chat um, yeah. function, and then we'll provide it in the show notes as well. Um, so that's great. That's great. Mm-hmm. Great resource from Stanford. Uh, and we haven't talked a lot about AMTs. We're going to spend more time on that later this week. But uh, obviously, the research that our, our, our AMC cohorts are doing across the country is, is so important to what we're dealing with. So um, appreciate you bringing that forward. Let's dive a little deeper. Um, you know, we have spent this podcast, uh, Chase, I think tomorrow is, is tomorrow or I've lost track. Three week anniversary, four week anniversary? I think I've lost track too, but I believe we're close to four weeks. Yeah, I think tomorrow, or maybe even so today, we'll complete it our fourth week, or we're entering for, I don't know, it doesn't matter. Most of the time, we've been talking about what uh, healthcare marketers and communicators can do in the moment to deal with the crisis. Um, Thursday of last week, and then yesterday, we pivoted a little bit to start thinking about what are things going to look like on the other side of this. And I think today, we'll straddle that fence, and we'll kind of cover both things, Dave. Um, based on some of the things that you and I wanted to touch on. Um, and the first one is a, a topic that, that you brought up that I think is really interesting to dive mm-hmm. into. What are some of the things we're learning about um, ourselves and how we work together, given this environment we're in now? Uh, obviously, a crisis situation, but also having to be remote. Um, and we've had some conversations about this in our agency, too. But why don't you touch on some of the insights that, that you found in terms of um, remote collaboration. We'll just start there, and then we'll we'll kind of pivot from that. Yeah, I, I think there's there's good and bad to it. Um, on you know the the daily work that I'm doing with Stanford, we're actually finding that um, people are definitely more engaged um, through through products like Zoom and, and WebEx. Um, it's it's been interesting. You wouldn't think that, but um, it's been a positive thing for us. And I have to say on a side, I have a junior in high school who's doing remote learning 
Um, and he likes it more than going to class, which is, you're not hearing many, a lot of news about that. Mm -hmm. He's actually sticking to the schedule. <laughs> so um, I do think these remote platforms don't have to be uh, uh, a negative. Um, so that, that's, that's been a positive. What, what we have learned with organizations like AMCs that tend to not be too advanced with their technology Yes, we're using the remote platforms, but we're noticing that the lack of uh, digital asset management, CRM, marketing automation, we're really envious of other industries that are, um, I'm getting touched by just about everyone I deal with. Of course, there's Amazon and others, but even nonprofits that are a little bit more advanced, um, don't have to go through, you know, tie, tying the, uh, the different parts of an IT system in a large organization like ANC mm -hmm. together are reaching out in all the new ways. Um, I, you know, I wish that we had more digital asset management to pull content on COVID together quickly, every day, update it, repurpose it, et cetera. Um, so I think that may lead to another point we can discuss that you're gonna see a big move towards MarTech stack type of, of investments. And we're in the middle of our budgeting right now at Stanford and that uh, that's an area we've talked quite a bit about, so. But I may have varied from your question a little bit. So. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> I think that's fine. Yeah. I think that's fine. I, I think, you know, we touched on this a couple of weeks ago that um, we didn't dive too deep into it, but there's been a lot of stories about how uh, health systems, a lot of the digital transformation initiatives have moved from this is going to be a 12 month to 18 month window to we need this yeah. done by next Thursday. Exactly. Um, and, and that goes beyond even what you're talking about in terms of MarTech, but just, you know, obviously virtual visits and a lot of those things. But, you know, it really does, you know, we've always said whether it's a Shushmid conference or a, when we're together, whatever, whatever the forum, <laughs> um, we've always talked about the, the, value of something like, let's say, CRM. Uh, and, and we still have, you know, probably two thirds, I'm sure somebody from the CRM industry could weigh in with the adoption of hospitals have CRM, um, true CRM access. And of course we can define what true means, but what we mean is a, a technology platform that's not an Excel spreadsheet, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and we touched on this a little bit in a podcast last week that I know you've heard, Dave, in mm -hmm. terms of, we had Brandon Edwards on yeah. and talked about the need for rapid recovery uh, coming out of this. And I think the value of something like CRM has just got to be obvious, right? Huge. Yeah. I, you know, it's interesting. Um, I think it's a forcing function. I don't know if you can refer to a pandemic in that way, but um, maybe a couple things we could talk about. One is I think it's going to force prioritization. And I think that's a good thing for marketing communications because we all complain, you know, when we get together, oh, I've got to do this brochure. I've got to do that thing. And particularly at AMC, you're doing a lot of work by department, re department requests. And you just do what, because you've always done it, right? I think you should take this as a window of opportunity to say, hey, there's, there's really a, a new normal. We've got to really look at efficiencies and use that to your advantage. And we're auditing uh, across the board. Our marketing materials we're doing is part of a brand uh, evolution project that started before this, but it's now more important than ever. And I could see organizations maybe getting rid of 25% of the things they do, projects that don't make the cut. And this is a forcing function to do that. It's not just marketing taking the initiative. I think everyone in health systems is saying, hmm, we've got to look at things through a new lens. So I think that's a powerful thing. The other would be more collaboration with IT and patient experience, because a lot of these mm -hmm. technologies are coming together. So patient experience, IT should be your best friends at work. I would add HR in there with all the internal communications that this is forcing upon us. I mean, really critical communications internally in support of our staff, in particular, our frontline staff. So I see it as a window of opportunity. And I think technology is one of those where if you kept getting pushback on the investment and right now with you know, software as a service and cloud-based technology, it's not that huge an investment. It's not that big a rock to move. So I think those type of things are things you should sort of put forward. A lot of us are doing fiscal year planning, so it's timely. Yeah, and, it, and it's, you know, the irony, of course, is maybe if you just even focus on something, one thing like CRM, yeah. now more than ever, if you don't have a CRM, you know, you can make arguments for why you would need it. But Absolutely. you're also making those arguments in a situation where 
marketing is, you know, typically not going to be the highest priority. You could be facing budget freezes, budget restrictions. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's kind of, it's one of those things like in the moment you most need it, it's going to be really difficult to pull forward for some of us. We talk about um, coming out of this and, and, you know, Brandon talking about rapid recovery and the need to, to get, to get back to the regular care that you have put on hold um, because that is the financial fuel for your organization. Uh, it's why we see so many hospitals and health systems suffering financially, right? The, the surgeries, the outpatient procedures, all that needs to get back, but we're going to have capacity issues. And so something like a CRM where, just take one example, right? You've got somebody who booked, say, a, a hip surgery for today. They booked it mm-hmm. back in January or February or whenever, and now that's been put off to May, um, and it's possible it might be put off again, um, mm-hmm. how can you stay in front of those people? Because, right. you know, in the past, you would just say, okay, we're going to schedule you. Here's your surgical instructions. You might have emailed those instructions again the week before, depending on the surgery. Uh, we can't be just having that level of interaction. We, we want to stay in front of these people, let them know we haven't forgotten about them, give them some tips on how to manage the pain in the interim, make sure they understand why they're being delayed. First of all, that's the right thing to do in terms of caring for patients. But also, the further you keep kicking these folks out, the more likely they are to be open to other, other places to go. And depending on where you're at with capacity versus your competitors, staying in front of them with personalized communications could be the thing that keeps them in your funnel um, exactly. and prevents them from popping into somebody else's, right? Exactly, exactly. And I, you know, I think too, some systems still uh, have disparities between departments or clinics that do online appointments and one that don't. This should be another forcing function to say, we have got to get more efficient. We've got a map to where availability and accessibility is. Or we're going to lose people. They're not going to put up with these long waits or miscommunication between different clinics and things like that. So that's another place where I think marketing can lead. Even you know, right now, we could be doing some analysis of that within our own organizations to see how we prepare for what I think Brandon was calling phase two and ultimately yeah. phase three post, uh, post COVID. And as, as I was saying earlier, we, um, uh, before the, before we went on air, um, we find there is capacity in telehealth at, at Stanford. So we are moving people to that and utilizing that. It probably was underutilized to some degree prior to this. So, oh yeah. Um, taking advantage of services we already had that were underutilized to some degree is important uh, as well. I mean, I think there's research that shows mm-hmm. like utilization of telehealth or virtual yeah. visits. We shouldn't confuse the two, right? Telehealth is a broader, can include a lot of things, but virtual visits, let's say, was in the teens. I mean, it's, it's really mm-hmm. underutilized and there's a lot of reasons for that. It's consumers, as our survey showed, far more than I would have expected, just don't even know that that's a thing. Exactly. Um, but also our organizations have, have not made it easy to access. There's also the financial side of it where, um, you know, early on in this crisis, CMS waived a lot of the restrictions in terms of reimbursement for virtual visits or Mm -hmm. suspended them, or I can't even tell you specifically what they did, but they made it a lot easier, right? Because for a long time, that's been a, well, you know, maybe in three years we can reimburse you for virtual visits, which is why it didn't happen as fast as it should have. So um, to your point, a crisis like this, nobody would wish this upon anybody, but if the silver lining is it's accelerating the changes that we need, um, then we should take advantage of it, which brings us to maybe another point, Dave, that you mm-hmm. brought up, which is um, this is a real opportunity to really elevate the perception of marketing in our organizations. Yeah, yeah you know, I think um, it's uh, there's there's a couple aspects to that, but um, marketing can play a key role. I, I gave the Stanford example of the of the daily survey, but the idea of actually doing some of this analysis, because there are staff members that aren't totally pulled into the crisis communication piece of this, preparing for what, what happens after. I don't know if that's the May-June time, but we call it summer. I think that's the way Brandon referred to it. Mm-hmm. And really pulling, pulling data, coming up with ideas. A lot of this is ideation. So I think one of the challenges we might have is, do you promote the brand? You come off of a, a thing like COVID and instilling, you know, building off that trust that's been developed of the healthcare organization. People are looking to us for answers. 
you extend that, talk about what you've done, talk about how you've moved the ball forward? Or is there going to be this big push from the financial side that says, let's promote these service lines to heck with the overall systemness. Let's promote the service line. I think marketing needs to have a point of view on that. Um, right. I would propose that you have a section in your fiscal year planning, if you're doing your usual deck that talks about COVID, lessons learned, how marketing will learn from those lessons and how it'll be applied to new levels of productivity, uh, new ways to build the business. And I think that's on us, right? We need to be the ones that are thinking about that. I'm not sure we can depend on various departments to do that. They're caught up in this thing day in and day out. And we have the chance to kind of sit back and think through this um, and I think it's all about you, you kind of being the purveyor of the future, right? What's this going to look like? What does success look like for us this summer, or this fall? And if marketing can lead that discussion with some data and with some insights, I think it's a, kind of a new role for marketing that we're not always looked to to be providing that or positioned that way internally. Yeah, I mean, if, if we believe that there could be some level of market share reset, right? Maybe not everybody's mm -hmm. starting from a blank slate. But certainly there'll be a lot up in the air depending on how organizations come out of this, how quickly they can come out of it, um, how fast they can transition from COVID response to, to normal everyday operations capacity, all of that. Um, you know, marketing, to be fair, has always been an incremental driver of service line volume, right? right. There's so much just baked in um, and it's, just, it's a critical role, uh, but now marketing really has uh, a lot to say about how quickly are we going to be able to get back to normal uh, mm -hmm. to all the points that you're saying. And so, and, and where does brand come in? I mean, most of what we would know is, is it's not one or the other, right? If you have the means, you should be doing both, particularly if you suffered during this crisis, right? Because brand in large part is, is perception and, and reputation. Uh, exactly. And if you had, if you had issues, if you had crises, if you were in the news for the wrong reasons, um, you have some repair to do You're just going right out there with service line messages uh, without providing um, that, that kind of connection um, could leave you wanting. So it's going to depend on a case by case basis. But yeah, and I would add chance. too. I mean, the, you know, when you think about brand, a lot of that can bring to bear on fundraising. You guys brought this up a couple of days ago, philanthropy. It's not going to fill the gap of these huge losses that some systems are suffering. Right. But I think particularly I work with AMCs, this idea of pointing out what, what was done and how the system addressed it and ways to help your, what I call development and advancement colleagues with the right amount of content and where appropriate, asking for help, right? I, I got email from my local system saying, we're battling the front lines with uh, coronavirus. They talked about their um, you know, temporary um, testing uh, options and you know, help us. I mean, it was, a, it was a direct ask. I work a bit with higher ed, I'm on the board of a college. I just got a letter from the president of the college that I'm on the board of that we're gonna see a 17 to 22% reduction in enrollment for the next semester. Mm -hmm. um, that's a definitely a hit. All these organizations are going to be leveraging some form of philanthropy, but you have to do it in the appropriate way. And I think that's where brand and storytelling and demonstrating your worth is going to be a powerful thing. And that's not service line marketing. Obviously, um, it's a little bit different, but I think we can help our colleagues on the development side in, in new ways that we haven't been able to do before. Yeah, and you mentioned the, the the letter that you received. Let's let's do one more point here before we wrap, yeah. and that is, you know, what can we learn from other industries? And I'm going to throw yeah. out one real quick, and then I'm going to let you add to what you had said. Because yeah. um, you mentioned before the use of CRM and how we, mm -hmm. you know, we can we can look at other industries and how they've been leveraging it. The one thing I'll say is that I would observe that we should learn from is again, always have the right tone and the right relevance and the appropriateness for this, right? Because to your point, I get emails every day from brands that in some capacity I've engaged with over the last 10 years, right? I still have my email address. Um, and in some cases, it's, it's really poignant. I mean, I think in most yeah. cases, I'll say the tone is right. But just because the tone is right, doesn't mean the context is right. And what I mean by that is like, um, gosh, if I can come up with an example. Um, Oh, let's say that I have, um, a, uh, I don't even know, could pick on a beer, right? Let's say I get an email from a beer manufacturer, right? Because for some reason I've, I've competed in a contest in the past from that brand. 
their tone may be right, but honestly, I'm not really interested in what Anheuser-Busch is doing during the coronavirus crisis, right? It's just, it's like, yes, your tone is right, but your brand is not relevant to this. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's part of the context, right? So I think everybody who's listening to this podcast, we work at organizations that are relevant to this crisis, but still just keep that in mind always with whatever you're doing. So that's one thing I think we can learn um, is appropriateness and relevance. Um, but I don't know if you've got another one you want to share, David, from some well, other industries. I, I, I'm an Amex customer. I'll, I'll give you one of a, okay, um, good. a customer, but one I'm not involved with. So Amex and Hilton have come together to offer hotel rooms for, I guess, Amex may be helping finance that or their partners for uh, frontline staff. And um, I, I think it's a fairly large investment. That just came through yesterday or today. I was informed of that. And I thought, wow, I feel good about that brand, right? They're going beyond. Hopefully there is... Um, you know, a bit of altruism there. I'm, I'm sure they're going to benefit from it, but it seemed like it was timely, struck the right tone, and really solved the problem. I think so many of these brands, here's what we're doing for COVID, and it's, it sounded like something they felt they had to do. Like, we have to come out with a statement and tell people right. that we're aware, and I'm like, but there's most of those messages, you're like, what's in it for me? I hate to be selfish, but what's the whippy there, right? right. The other, um, I'm not an HBO customer, but I thought it was pretty cool that some of these streaming services, I'm an ES, I'm a Disney Plus customer, I'm a Prime customer, making shows available. Now, the benefit is, hey, I get some entertainment. I have two teenagers at home. We got to come up with you know, ways to keep them occupied and entertained. But I'm going to feel pretty good about that brand moving forward. And I might really like uh, a particular series that I wasn't willing to maybe pay for before that I might say, well, it's worth the it's it's worth the money and plus I have a very good feeling about their outreach and the things they did during a very trying time that benefited me personally. So I do think we can learn from that. I um, <coughs> as I said, I have a, a junior that's in college and we had to cancel a ten day father and son college tour. I was really looking forward to it. I think he was. But anyway, <laughs> uh, we're doing virtual tours now and it's interesting. We really start them next week, but I'm going to really look closely at how colleges handle and how, what, what the tone and manner is, how many resources they, they, are they just, you know, they've had already and just, oh, go do the virtual tour or personalize it through Zoom interviews that follow a tour, um, new ways to engage, because I just cited that letter from a college president. They're going to have to get creative. This is a forcing function for them, too, and how will they use platforms. And in many ways, they're a lot like us. They do a lot of recruiting of talent, just like our schools of medicine do. They need to stay in touch. It's a huge purchase. It's a personal purchase, particularly for a parent who may be paying a huge bill. So I do think there are ways we can learn from these other industries. But I love these, particularly streaming companies, offering us value-add things at no cost to kind of lighten the load. And I think that's uh, a really important element. I, for one, I'll put a plug in for a local restaurant here, Italian restaurant. They're charging me, but they're having a virtual wine tasting and dinner with an Italian food and wine expert. They, yeah, I live in Utah, so we're really strict with the alcohol laws, but you have signed up, you pay a fee, you're going to be with 16 other people, you go buy the wines of the Utah State Liquor Store, the two wines that they recommend, and we have, we really have a discussion. Are they open for business? No, they do a bit of takeout, but this is, a, is about as personal as you can get as a restaurant today. And this is a small business, right? They're right. using available third-party technologies that we all have access to to do it. So I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> no, I, that, that's all good stuff. And I think yeah. the, the last thing I'll leave with is, um, I mean, I spend most of my time on LinkedIn. I have, I, yeah. I quit Twitter almost two years ago now. I quit Facebook three years ago for reasons that are not appropriate for this podcast. But <laughs> LinkedIn is where I get most of my interaction. And I've seen some people eviscerate brands just like it, it doesn't matter what they do like hey right. stop selling us and, and it's transparent and you're, it's disgusting and some of it's over the top and, and I and mm-hmm. I feel like look back off a little bit like yeah. to your point is there a benefit to HBO to exposing their services to more people that they might well sure yeah. but it, also what they're doing is is great and helpful and so I think you can kind of suss out the folks that are trying to, to take advantage of the situation versus people exactly. that are just generally trying to help. So like there's people in our industry, David, maybe you've seen them on LinkedIn who, who are like, hey, you can take, you can use our product hospitals um, at no cost, right? So mm-hmm. 
Good. Is it at no cost, but it's like you have to sign up and it's no cost until for like three months and then you're hooked into it. Okay. That seems to be taking advantage. If it's just like, here, take it. We're just trying to help. That's okay. Like, like don't get on them for that. Um, people want yeah. to try to help. And so I think, you know, you just have to keep it all in perspective. That's, mm -hmm. that'll be our sign off. Like Chase, Chase and I are trying to figure out how to do one takeaway each podcast. So Chase, I, I'm going to do what I said. I wasn't comfortable <laughs> nice. with. try to come yeah. up with it on the spot. Um, but I would say like, always keep in mind with this stuff. Um, how's it going to sound from the outside? Keep it in the right perspective. Um, and I think you'll be safe. So let's use that to close the show. We're right at the, at the bottom of the hour. So Dave, thank you so much for joining us. You're very welcome. I enjoyed it. Yeah, absolutely thrilled to have you on. Um, Chase, as always, sir, thank you. Yes, absolutely. And as I mentioned before, tomorrow, Jeff Spear will be sitting in my chair, not literally, um, but figuratively hosting the show. Uh, and he'll be joined by Ben Fuqua, who is our data analytics function. And they're going to be diving into that survey that we talked about earlier. Um, remember, if there's anything you want us to cover, let us know. Put it in the chat channel right now. You can email me at cab at thinkrevivehealth.com. Um, definitely go to thinkrevivehealth.com for recording of this episode, any of our other content like the survey. Um, you'll see the banner at the top of our homepage. Remember that you can subscribe on iTunes and let others know about this podcast. And to everybody out there who's working in marketing communications for hospital health system, remember the work you're doing is so critical to your organizations and to our country and getting through all of this communications is so vital. So hang in there, keep up the good work. We'll be back tomorrow uh, and every weekday until this, this all passes. So thanks for joining and we will talk to you next time.